esteemed ladies and gentlemen, yesterday at the plenary session, high on the agenda was in the issue were the issues of international trade, and indeed uh, international commerce uh, is the blood system of all the international tra tra activity because uh, thanks uh, to the necessity to enter new markets uh, to sell goods and uh, to seek uh, new goods uh, great geographical discoveries were made cities were built and uh, countries uh, were being developed we are aware of the great uh, silk way that was in existence uh, a long time ago and uh, we know that the Volga River, the waterway, was used for ships uh, navigating the river from the south uh, to north, uh, and uh, there were cities uh, emerging on the banks of the Volga River. And yesterday, there was a birthday of the remarkable city that is the venue of uh, the forum, and uh, the city came into being as uh, the window to to Europe. Uh, St. Petersburg emerged and uh, evolved as a city of St. Petersburg associated with the new uh, quality of the trade routes uh, and the trade relations uh, with Europe. So it goes without saying that the subject, the agenda we are going to discuss now is uh, very important. Allow me, t uh, as a moderator, to announce uh, the uh, agenda and the order of the day. Ten minutes uh, allocated to the speakers to be followed up by the discussion. I would like uh, to introduce uh, the panelists uh, that will be participating in the discussion together with me and the co-moderating the round table. It is uh, Mr. Alexey Andronov, General Counsel and uh, Director of the Legal Department of uh, the Megapolis uh, Closed Joint Stock Company. And uh, the, his uh, topic is introduction of the internal rules adopted to counter illicit trade. Mr. Stefano Betti, Senior Counsel of uh, Legal Issues of Interpol. Mr. Stefano Betti is uh, coordinating the legal work associated with the illicit trade and the manufacturing of uh, illicit goods, and he will be talking on eradication and prevention of illicit trade and innovative interpretation of uh, international treaties. Uh, then we uh, have uh, Louise van Groenen, director, and uh, she is uh, from uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization. The subject matter she is going to talk to is the role of international law on uh, prevention and eradication. Uh, VIPO is the organization that uh, administering a number of uh, the intellectual property conviction convention, the pri primarily Burns uh, Convention on the protection of uh, the literature and uh, arts uh, and on the intellectual property convention. Since uh, 2004, she acts, uh, it uh, acts, the organization acts uh, as a specialized entity of the UN uh, on uh, creative activity and intellectual property rights. Mr. Dmitry Volchkov, uh, he is uh, deputy head of the Department of uh, Combating International uh, Crime, National Bureau of Interpol of the Minister of Internal Affairs of the Russian Federation. The topic is the capacity of the National uh, Criminal Bureau of Interpol related to ICR. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Luigi uh, Estebano, and uh, is, he is dealing with uh, uh, the institutional issues of Interpol related uh, to illicit uh, goods and uh, 
uh, laws and uh, the subject matter is the innovative approaches uh, to combating illicit trade and the uh, contemporary challenges. Uh, Mr. Konstantin Reiner, he is uh, the government pa partner of uh, Philip Morris related to the issues uh, of illicit uh, trade. The subject is illicit trade in tobacco products and uh, the major trends of uh, countering illicit trades of tobacco products. In my introduction address, uh, I would like uh, to say a few words on uh, the notion of illicit trade as it is interpreted by the international law. The internalization of uh, crime and the growth of uh, the number of offenses uh, that uh, relate the interests of a number of the states uh, and uh, the uh, ingenuity of uh, the uh, crime uh, calls uh, for the states uh, to interact and uh, take joint uh, measures uh, to prevent illicit trade. Illicit trade uh, concerns not only the individual states but the international community on the whole. It is uh, related to such things as elite, illicit trade, black market, shadow economics, uh, and uh, it is uh, detrimental to the states uh, and uh, it uh, results uh, of uh, not only economic uh, effects uh, but social as well. And uh, the it uh, is detrimental to the economic security of the state. Illicit trade is manifested in different uh, manners depending on uh, what are the tangible or non-tangible uh, products and the values are treated as goods. It uh, could be uh, the uh, goods uh, that uh, with the sales uh, regulated by some rules uh, such as uh, arms, uh, weapons, narcotics and uh, psychotropic substances, the pieces of culture and arts, uh, then uh, uh, the species uh, of uh, fauna and flora, it could be IPR, goods uh, uh, with uh, illicit trade uh, causing damage uh, to the right uh, holders. And uh, illicit goods uh, could uh, be uh, people in uh, illicit uh, people trafficking uh, or body organs. And uh, it uh, will be the subject of the discussion. We are aware that uh, the illegal production Manufacturing of uh, drugs uh, is uh, one of the most dynamically developing sectors of the criminal economics, and it uh, turned, evolved into the transnational criminal industry with a lot of uh, proceeds uh, e extracted from it. Uh, some experts uh, claim that uh, it amounts to 8% of all the international trade. And uh, the most uh, significant uh, agreements and contracts are such documents uh, as uh, the Unified uh, Convention on, of 1961 and the UN Conventions uh, against the illicit trafficking of uh, narcotic drugs and psychotropic uh, substances of 1998. And uh, the amount of uh, proceeds the illegal arms trade uh, is uh, second uh, to narcotic drugs uh, trafficking and uh, the differentiation between the uh, legal and illicit uh, traffic uh, is related to the end user and uh, quite important uh, role is uh, played uh, by the resolutions of the UN Security Council that uh, puts a ban to supply weapons uh, that are under international sanctions. The people trafficking is a uh, problem is uh, quite acute it uh, includes uh, transportation of uh, illegal immigrants uh, uh, females uh, for prostitutions uh, and uh, household uh, help and the uh, chids uh, for illegal adoption and uh, in according to the data of the international migration organization the proceeds uh, from the illegal people trafficking is six billion per year the UN reports uh, some uh, four million people are subjected to 
illicit uh, people trafficking, and one fourth of them are in the sex uh, industry. Girls and, and boys are moved from one country to another, sometimes uh, from one continent to another, along uh, the well organized uh, channels uh, communicating Africa, Asia, Europe, and uh, South America. quite uh, closely connected uh, to people trafficking or trafficking of human bodies, uh, homeless and underprivileged of uh, developing countries are the suppliers of the organs for transplantation. And uh, this uh, particular market uh, poses uh, a very heavy threat as well. And uh, there are major international instruments. It is uh, the UN Convention Against uh, People Trafficking and uh, Exploitation of uh, Prostitution of uh, 49, and the Protocol to Eradicate of People Trafficking, especially females and uh, uh, children, and uh, the instruments uh, that uh, make those uh, uh, acts uh, punishable, the Protocol of 2000, of the year of 2000. The uh, market uh, of uh, the art and uh, the uh, trade uh, in uh, the endangered uh, species uh, of uh, vegetations and uh, animals. Uh, it is also the matter of interest of the organized crime. I would like to draw your attention to th such documents as the UN Conventions uh, on Measures uh, to Prevent and uh, Forbid the uh, trade, uh, illicit trade in pieces of art, and the UN Convention on International uh, Trade of uh, Wild uh, Nature Species, which are endangered. Uh, it is the Convention of uh, 1973. And uh, the other illegal, illicit markets uh, that have been developing, it is uh, faked uh, goods, uh, pornographic uh, products uh, with underage uh, participating in, in it, uh, alcohol, beverage, uh, faked uh, documents and papered. Uh, quite uh, important uh, is uh, the uh, market related to lobbying, corruptions, uh, trading of interests uh, and uh, trading of votes quite important role is played by the international law. Conclusion of uh, universal, uniform international laws uh, targeting uh, different uh, forms of illicit trade are an important uh, document uh, of uh, countering international crime. I would like to request uh, the panelists uh, to use uh, microphones uh, when speaking because uh, there's uh, a recording going on, and uh, please uh, bear it in mind. I would like to, to give a floor to Stefano, to Mr. Stefano Betti. Okay, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the floor. And um, also thanks to the organizers of this, um, of this big conference, this legal forum, and for having accepted our, our proposal by, by, that was submitted a few months ago by Interpol to, to have a panel on this uh, delicate and very important topic, which is um, illicit trade, in our, in our opinion. Um, I would uh, stay within the 10 minutes without a problem, although I could probably speak much more. But I, I would like just to give, to give you our, our perspective in a very succinct, uh, in a succinct manner. And I would like to address two main issues in this, uh, in this little time. First of, all, first of all, say a little bit about something about why IP, intellectual property crime and illicit trade, is a growing phenomenon, is a, growing, is a warring phenomenon worldwide. And uh, uh, what, in our opinion, should be done to counter it? Does an international legal framework exist that can be used against this, and how? Why is it a worrying phenomenon? I think already uh, the chairman of this panel has um, addressed this issue already. 
Um, it's a warring phenomenon because of its size and because it basically involves all countries worldwide to a more or lesser extent, but everybody and every single country is, is affected. Illicit trade normally, when we talk about this phenomenon, we are talking about a country of origin where some products are manufactured, a country of transit or even several countries of transits and normally a country of destination, right? But if you want to, to draw a map of the various um, um, routes of illicit trade worldwide, we will see that it, it will be a very confused one. Uh, because many countries are, in many occasions, affected both as, as origin countries and the transit or destination countries. Okay? We know, for example, that uh, a, a lot of um, um, counterfeiting activity, a manufacturing of counterfeited goods, comes from, uh, from Asian countries. They transit through um, ports, including free trade zones in the Middle East, and, uh, and, uh, and go as far as Europe, right? This is something that pretty much everybody, everybody knows. Um, but there is also the other direction that is taking place, meaning there is a lot of smuggling, for instance, of natural resources and wildlife species taking place from Africa and going to the other, to the other direction, going to Asia as a destination country. It's a very complex phenomenon with, with various routes. Uh, the phenomenon is growing worldwide. I, I could mention many, many figures. I will limit uh, myself to, to one just to give an idea. Just in uh, um, the, the US, uh, the United States Customs, for example, have reported a 24% increase in the seizure of counterfeit goods between 2010 and 2011. This is, in our opinion, very significant. Um, this increase in the seizure of, manu of, of, of counterfeit stuff may be in part due to a higher capacity by customs authorities to, to better detect suspicious consignments and to sign them, but it, in our opinion it shows also that the, the, the sheer scale of manufacturing of uh, counterfeiting activities worldwide is growing. Right? Uh, this type of crime is worrying because of a huge gap that exists between the huge profits that criminals uh, make out of, this, uh, out of this business and the little risk they have of being caught and of being punished with uh, deterrent penalties. This is very important. Huge, product, huge uh, uh, profits, right? And here again I would, mention, I, would, I would just give you an example to give you an idea. Um, there was an evaluation done in 2005 by the British um, intelligence service uh, that um, um, estimated that a pirated DVD uh, produced in Asia costs approximately 70 US dollars, but when it was sold on the streets of London, it would reach um, the price of uh, nine US dollars. So you can see very well the margin and the profit that can be gained out of this uh, business, which makes, and this is a, a little bit worrying, I think, the, um, which makes pirated DVDs potentially even more profitable than, than selling um, Iranian heroin or, or, Col or Colombian cocaine, which is something to think about. The little risk for, for, for offenders I was mentioning before, most countries in the world have very low penalties for this sort of um, crime. Sometimes not even custodial penalties are applied, but simple financial penalties. Um, so there is an incentive to actually for, for these criminals to launch into this illegal business. But maybe the greatest service rendered to those busy in illicit trade comes from a, a general underlying culture of criminal justice officials in many parts of the world, whereby intellectual property violations and illicit trade are not really serious crimes. Um, the big perception, the very widespread perception is nobody was ever harmed by 
uh, buying a, a fake Prada or Dolce Gambana bag. So where is the problem here? There are more serious issues to face in the world such as terrorism and human trafficking. It's a legitimate perspective which um, f um, forgets at the same time that behind illicit trade activities there are very often um, um, sophisticated transnational organized criminal groups that are, that are acting. No. And the involvement of organized crime in illicit trade normally takes two forms. First form is illicit trade as a source of money that is used by criminal groups to commit other forms of crimes, including terrorism. The other way around is also true, meaning money originated from other crimes that are invested into the manufacturing of illegal counterfeit uh, products. So it works both ways, and this is pretty worrying, right? So to address uh, uh, briefly the, 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 second, the second question, what should be done about this? Uh, in the legal office of Interpol, we have developed a, a handbook in which we try to make sense out of the various conventions that are applicable. And uh, we mainly identify five main areas in which we believe policymakers should, uh, should focus in order to address this phenomenon. How are illicit trade practices made illegal in a certain legal system? Are they criminalized? Are they not criminalized? Are they subject to adequate questions? Second set of questions. Are law enforcement authorities equipped with the proper investigative powers to look into, into illicit trade? Um, are there necessary regulatory, regulatory frameworks in place? Uh, meaning those frameworks that are expected to provide licensee, licenses and concessions to the licit form of that business. Um, and how about other important set of questions? The possibility to confiscate proceeds of crime that are stemming from illicit trade activities. Uh, last set of questions. Is there a legal framework in the country to give and rec receive international cooperation in criminal matters through extradition, through mutual legal assistance? Is it working? Um, these are the main questions that we think should be um, addressed very clearly in order to face this phenomenon. The main message we want to get across is that an international legal framework against illicit trade and IP crime exists, and it can significantly assist authorities in designing a legal framework, a national legal framework against illicit trade, um, including by guiding them in addressing some of the main questions that I've mentioned before. But then the question is, wh where is this legal framework found? Okay. There is no, just, not just one convention or one international treaty dealing with illicit trade as such, because illicit trade is a is a slippery phenomenon, is multifaceted. Um, it constantly changes its manifestation and phase depending on, uh, on, the, on marketing opportunities, on the dynamics of international commerce, etc. So if we have no, uh, no, no, no single treaty, we need, to, uh, we need to cooperate against this phenomenon by picking up bits and pieces of uh, convention that exists worldwide in specific sectors. And the chairman has already mentioned the number of, this, uh, of these conventions, which again are sector specific, meaning they really focus on specific manifestations of illicit trade. He mentioned a few. I would add, for instance, the uh, World Trade Organization um, agreement on trade-related aspects of international property, the TRIPS agreement, specifically on IP crime, um, the Convention on Illicit Import and Export of Cultural Objects, um, and a couple of conventions that uh, are potentially relevant, although they have not yet entered into force, which is the uh, WHO uh, Protocol on the Illicit Trade in Tobacco Products, and the Council of Europe Convention dealing with illicit trade in, in, in pharmaceutical uh, products. Uh, the list can continue. Huh? Uh, the main point I want to stress is that, in our opinion, 
yes, we should refer to these conventions when we try to find a global answer, but there are also at least the two global treaties that are important in this area. These treaties were not, were not designed to, um, to address illicit trade, but they can be very useful. And these are the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the UN Convention Against Corruption. Again, they don't deal directly with illicit trade, but what these conventions do is they, is they deal with the facilitators of illicit trade practices, right? They deal with the basic conducts which make illicit trade possible, corruption, participation in an organized criminal group, or they make illicit trade profitable through, corrupt, through, through money laundering and through obstruction of justice practices. Um, in many cases, these two conventions are forgotten or, or let's say are not used to their own potential as very important legal mechanism that states should or can use to facilitate international cooperation through extradition, mutual legal assistance, etc. Um, they provide an important legal framework for the confiscation of proceeds of crime, witness protection, etc. Uh, there is, of course, no intention here to go into the details of these treaties, but the main message is that against illicit trade, we have a legal framework. This is pretty obvious. It is less obvious uh, to be able to put together the various bits and pieces of this legal framework and to see how these bits and pieces complement each other in order to create some, form, some sort of synergies um, and to use uh, to the maximum extent all that, international, that the international com community offers states in this, uh, in this area since, again, there is no one single treaty devoted to it. I will stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Indeed, the, there are a great uh, number of uh, standards and laws uh, that uh, regulate international trade, and uh, we are not limited by the agreements, uh, only we realize that uh, any international agreement uh, should uh, be implemented when uh, concluded and uh, the agree uh, any agreement uh, is uh, being uh, included into the legislative uh, framework uh, of the nations uh, that uh, have signed it in uh, russia the uh, illicit trade is uh, criminalized. Uh, uh, there are clauses of criminal code, administrative code, and uh, a number of the issues uh, are addressed uh, by the civil code. I cannot list uh, all the laws and bylaws uh, that have been enacted, uh, those that are related to the illicit trade, but there are efforts uh, undertaken to combat it. I would like to give floor now to uh, our next uh, speaker. and. Uh, Ms. Uh, Louisa uh, Van Groenen, and uh, I've uh, introduced uh, her, and uh, she's going to talk about the IPR. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the panel. It's really a pleasure to be here. I represent the World Intellectual Property Organization. So I will follow up from uh, Mr. Stefano Betti to talk a little bit of the problem relating to intellectual property crimes. Now, obviously you may know that uh, WIPO is really the forum for intellectual property. We administer no less than 26 conventions, uh, not only the Berne, but the Paris Convention and the whole number more relating to intellectual property. We also have 188 member states to the organization. And the mission of the organization is really to use the value and underscore the value of intellectual property for sustainable economic growth through creation and innovation. 
Um, the organization, the first convention was already 1883, so it's a rather old convention. And we joined the United Nations system um, a whole substantial number of years ago as a specialized agency. Just the other day, I was invited to talk at the um, telecom um, union in Geneva because they looked at the whole question of counterfeit, uh, counterfeit mobile devices. And in preparing for this presentation, I saw what you see on the screen, even websites warning consumers, because it seems that very often you buy your mobile, mobile device in an uh, official trading outlet and yet it is counterfeit. So it seems that this problem is really in all areas. I also noticed on the internet how blasé these uh, people are, the counterfeiters. Can you imagine that they offer, and it says explicitly, that they make high quality copies of the brands and they mentioned Lotus Ferrari. Now if you buy your car on the internet, beware, it may be a fake. And as I said, it really relates to all industries and what Stefano said is really true. It is really a growing phenomenon and of universal concern. He also made reference to the uh, TRIPS agreement, which is the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Now, you may know that um, our organization has a cooperation agreement with the World Trade Organization to implement this agreement. And my division specifically uh, deal with part three of the TRIPS agreement containing the enforcement provisions. So in this context, we work very closely with our colleagues from Interpol, WCO, the World Customs Organization, and other organizations. And in TRIPS, it's very clear that there should be civil remedies, and the objective is to deter the infringement of intellectual property rights. And of course, we have the criminal provisions, and I think it is very important to note that there should be penalties really to deter. And as Stefano said, this is not really the case in all the countries. We find that the risk is really low, the penalties are low, and yet, I repeat, the profits are extremely high. The whole ambition which we have in the organization, nonetheless, is to balance the private rights and the public interest. And when we look at private rights and we see the criminal law kicking in, it is purely because of the public interest. And I think once we understand the public interest, we would understand that these crimes are not purely uh, victimless crimes and would, will do no harm to um, the public at large. The gentleman is just standing in front of me. Uh, the public interest, of course, thank you very much. The public interest in protecting IP rights is really job creation that is very important. <laughs> Tax customs income, public health and safety, and that is a very, very important uh, element. And we find this more and more that goods are counterfeit that can really cause damage to health and safety the prevention of corruption and organized crime, which was already stated, and of course foreign investment and investor, uh, investor confidence. Can you imagine that the investor will take his money to a country where there is not a legal framework in place to assist him against the infringement and criminal infringement of his intellect, uh, intellectual property rights? And of course also international trade relations. Of course, we can get sanctions against our countries if we do not comply with these provisions. 
Um, it was already mentioned that the infringement of intellectual property rights is really a global problem, targeting all industries from low quality to high quality goods. And that is really a problem. It's the sophistication now of infringing goods, which make it really difficult even for the right holders to distinguish these goods. Um, we, on the other hand, have to look at socioeconomic factors and so often we hear, but you know we don't have money, the original goods are expensive, we don't have access to them, they're not available. Very often law enforcement would tell us, why on earth should we protect the rights of companies that do not even invest in our countries? So there is that component as well, which we have to take into account and we have to strike a balance. Uh, in most other countries, we have systemic problems. Courts are overburdened. We feel that the judiciary is not properly qualified to deal with intellectual property cases. We have police who are not properly qualified to investigate or they think they are not properly qualified. I believe that uh, intellectual property crime is a statutory crime like any other crime. And if you can deal with a statutory crime, it is not so difficult to deal with an intellectual property crime. I simply say so because I was a public prosecutor myself. And you look at the elements of a crime, you look at what you have to prove, and you go for it. But we nonetheless find that there's a bit of a mental block in law enforcement when it comes to the prosecution of intellectual property crime. We shouldn't look at intellectual property crimes uh, on its own. It's really part of the legal framework and there are many related laws and one should see the whole matter in context. And if you cannot prosecute or investigate uh, on your intellectual property crime because you don't have a right holder assistance or whatever, just think of other related laws which can also be very important if you want goods to be removed in order to protect the public. And I will not go into detail, but some of these laws were already mentioned by our colleague from Interpol. Coming to proceeds of crime, I think this is really the issue uh, which we should put focus on. Because one should do something to take away the incentive to commit uh, intellectual property crimes. These crimes are extremely lu uh, lucrative. I think some years ago um, somebody mentioned that if you take a kilogram of infringing DVDs and what you can make as a profit from them, it is in fact, as Stefano said, more lucrative than dealing in certain forms of, of drugs or cannabis. So one should keep that also in mind. And I think the UN, uh, UN Convention Against Corruption and Transnational Organized Crimes can really in future be the way to go. Luckily now we see in some countries more and more newspaper reports in which uh, it is reported that the courts made these orders and said the proceeds of crime should be taken away from the criminals and that is very encouraging to see developments in this direction. Now my division, why I am here today, uh, the division was previously, previously known as the Enforcement Division. It's now known as the Building Respect for IP Division because there's an additional component. The one component is enforcement of intellectual property rights, assist member states to have the legal frameworks in place and within which you can get the remedies. And the other component is to create awareness of the benefits of respecting intellectual property rights for sustainable growth. So there are these two elements. We help quite a number of countries with legislative assistance to comply with part three of the TRIPS agreement. And I must say, 
we do a lot of capacity building as well and we get really the assistance of right holders and of other organizations who are also concerned with these issues. Another objective is to integrate the IP-related issues into the work of other organizations and I'm very pleased to report that we have very good working relations and memoranda of understanding with, for example, Interpol and other organizations. The Advisory Committee on Enforcement is where we do policy dialogue relating to enforcement matters. And the mandate of this committee is to work with organizations and the private sector to combat counterfeiting and piracy through education, training, awareness, cooperation and the like. And you may know that we are in close cooperation with Interpol, World Customs Organization and the private sector to do global congresses on combating counterfeiting and piracy. The next one will be hosted by Interpol. We don't know when. Another organization we work quite closely with is the United Nations Environmental Program. We cannot today make fires anymore of all these mountains and mountains of infringing goods. There should be other ways and that is what we should explore. And if we do not assist law enforcement to empty the warehouses of these infringing goods in an in environmentally friendly way, that will hamper the enforcement activities. So this is very interesting and we did quite a bit of work in this regard and you will also find in the documents of the advisory committee uh, documents dealing with how to deal and to dispose of infringing goods. I give you some facts and figures. We work in all the countries around the globe, Africa, Asia, Pacific, Caribbean. We train law enforcement officials and, of course, the judiciary. Some, just some statistics for you. We have very good uh, assistance from the right holders, companies like Unilever and others, where we can really see that law enforcement officials understand that these goods have really penetrated our houses and our lives and we should do something about it. We have experts to help us and we really make our um, participants work and we want them to understand that it is in their capacity to deal with intellectual property issues. We also have the WIPO case books. We have it now in English, in Arabic, in Spanish and French. So that is available online. You can just download it for free or you can order the copy from us. Um, we are ready to assist the Russian speaking countries to develop a case book which can be useful uh, in intellectual property matters. We do a lot of awareness. We have to reach out and make people understand that through non-punitive measures, one can learn to, uh, to respect intellectual property rights and to understand the benefits of uh, respecting intellectual property rights. We have a lot of tools available. If you are interested, we can make it available. And on this note, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Van Groenen. We, uh, the speakers uh, who wanted to talk about intellectual property, they have done their intellectual work with slides and everything. And I'm um, handing over the floor to a representative of our uh, um, uh, Interpol Bureau, uh, who's been very active in and has been recognized all, uh, all over the world. And uh, as an act of this um, recognition, 
um, was uh, uh, Alexander Prakapchuk being elected as one of the senior officials of Interpol. And I give the floor to Dmitry Volchkov. I have already uh, presented him. And he'll talk about uh, how Russian Interpol Bureau is able to uh, counter um, crime in uh, intellectual property area. I'll uh, tell you what our Russian Interpol Bureau is doing uh, or when countering uh, uh, counterfeit uh, crimes. Uh, according to the Interpol uh, experts' estimate, estimations, uh, the majority of intellectual uh, uh, property crimes uh, has to do with piracy, uh, with uh, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, audio and video discs, and uh, various products like uh, children's clothes, electronics, clocks. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, falsified goods market is uh, almost as profitable, holds the third place in profitability after arms trade and narcotics trade. Uh, in, uh, in various countries, destination can, in uh, supply countries uh, and uh, mediator countries would often assist in packaging, for example. And uh, those organized criminal organizations would prepare all the documents and uh, provide the supply and uh, special companies are created to do money laundering, uh, uh, counterfeited documents are being produced and uh, uh, very often well, it, it is one of the most uh, common ways of the criminals. Internet has become uh, the most popular medium of uh, supplying uh, counterfeit produce. Uh, illicit and counterfeit goods are a real threat to economical uh, security of Russia. I'm talking about uh, uh, major uh, manufacturers. Uh, the losses uh, the, uh, the losses amount to billions of dollars a year. Uh, judging from the internal ministry data, uh, in the years 2014, the year 2015, we have a decrease in a number of uh, crimes this, uh, in, in this area. What are the main characteristics of the markets of the, uh, where these counterfeit produce is being s uh, sold? Uh, mainly they come from uh, East, uh, East uh, Southern Asia. Uh, it is being brought, counterfeit produce is being brought from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and India. It is also being transferred from Bulgaria, Poland, and Turkey. But the turnover of counterfeit products uh, has uh, to do also with the fact that a lot of uh, Ill illicit goods are produced on the territory in Russia. A lot of uh, manufacturers use very sophisticated technology which can be compared with that of the original manufacturers. And it's very hard to tell a counterfeit from the original. You can only do it when you use spe specific technology. And high price does not guarantee uh, the buyer that he is buying an original item. Uh, they can also be uh, the illicit goods can also be produced at legal factories during night shifts. Uh, there are ways uh, 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 the uh, routes of illicit goods supply also uh, are the same uh, as the illegal immigration routes. At present, uh, 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 illicit good producers uh, not only use markets or open markets, but they use internet shops and smaller shops and boutiques. Uh, to counter uh, counterfeit uh, products uh, is very difficult. It's a very difficult and multifaceted task, and it needs uh, law enforcement efforts and uh, legislation efforts. Uh, in the Russian Federation, we have uh, we uh, we are, we have introduced uh, complex measures to counter uh, infringement of uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, 
and uh, to prevent uh, falsified uh, products uh, and food from uh, and uh, uh, dietary supple supplements from entering uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, to make this uh, work more efficient, uh, we annually uh, conduct uh, a preventive uh, counterfeit operation. Uh, its major objective is to counter infringement of uh, 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 intellectual property rights to counter illegal production and uh, illegal turnover of uh, pharmaceuticals, of uh, uh, clothes and uh, various other goods. As a result, in 2014, uh, uh, we have managed to discover the damages. Uh, most often, uh, the criminals would counterfeit children's toys, uh, perfume and cosmetics, uh, alcohol products, uh, butter, oil, tinned goods. Well, to illustrate, I'll give you a, an example, a case. Um, uh, when a group of people try to uh, to sell counterfeit mineral water uh, under Barjomi trademark, and uh, the number uh, of the bottles was amounted to 34,000 bottles, and they were all labeled as Barjomi water, and after uh, uh, the warehouses were searched, the uh, law enforcement offices found counterfeit uh, products and uh, equipment uh, to produce this, uh, this water. As a result, uh, the uh, brand holder suffered damages which amounted to 9 million rubles. Uh, I don't think I need to prove uh, and to explain that uh, alcohol, uh, illicit alcohol goods can be even more dangerous. Just a small example, a tragedy uh, which took place in Turkey in 2011 when Russian tourists uh, drank counterfeit whiskey when taking a yacht trip. And uh, Russian Interpol Bureau uh, organized investigation, uh, cooperating with our Turkish partners to ensure fast uh, transfer of documents. Uh, uh, we uh, sent over legal aid uh, documents, and we received uh, important information uh, for the investigation from the Turkish authorities. And according to uh, the information we received through Interpol chan uh, channels, uh, Turkish uh, law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, legal Authorities informed us that uh, the case has been treated and uh, the, those, uh, the criminals were charged and uh, treated, uh, the, the case was treated in court. Uh, national borders do not prevent illicit and counterfeit goods from traveling from one country to another. And in this sense, uh, co cooperation between police authorities uh, becomes very important. And Russian Interpol Bureau uh, supports the initiative uh, proposed by the uh, General Secretary uh, Office of Interpol in this respect. At present, uh, we've, uh, we're exchanging information using Interpol channel, uh, channels with uh, uh, informing each other uh, in, and informing uh, international and foreign uh, right holders about the damages they might be suffering in other countries. Uh, informing them of the uh, activities, uh, of criminal activities. 
during uh, their visit uh, to a Czech Republic, uh, Russian uh, uh, representatives of the Russian Interpol, um, Inter Interpol Bureau uh, when discussing the Opsen 4 operation uh, and meeting their Interpol colleagues, uh, we discussed, uh, we suggested that uh, Opsen and counterfeit operations could be carried out simultaneously, uh, countering and preventing um, turnover of illicit goods in both countries. Uh, dear colleagues, as you can see from my speech, the share of counterfeit and illicit goods is growing and uh, they're becoming more and more varied uh, from food to drugs and uh, various goods. And we're concerned with the spread of uh, counterfeit uh, drugs, especially on Internet. It is uh, their presence on Internet, it is their distribution via Internet, uh, ensures higher profits, high revenues, and minimizes the risks for the criminals. Uh, World Health Organization studies uh, illicit drugs market, and uh, it is antibio antibiotics, which are being counterfeited uh, and uh, they are maybe the major uh, uh, analgetics. Uh, these counterfeit drugs come to Russia from India and China, and uh, the certificates are is even issued in Russia itself. Uh, and I don't need to uh, tell you about the threats uh, these illicit drugs pose to, uh, to people. We need to create an efficient legal base to counter this threat. Starting from 19, uh, 2009, uh, Russian Interpol Bureau has been an active participant in the, uh, gen uh, in the uh, Interpol uh, measures, um, uh, like Pangea operation. Uh, starting from 2009, we've uh, gone through seven stages of this operation. And more and more Interpol member states are taking part in this operation which uh, proves that uh, the states are eager and ready to participate in this fight. Uh, international community is leading against falsified and illicit drugs. Uh, Pangea operation uh, discovers internet websites uh, selling illicit drugs, uh, detects their suppliers, and extract them. Over, over the past six years, uh, this operation has been highly uh, well, recognized on the highest level, uh, both in Russia and uh, internationally. It is only possible because various bodies and various institutions are working together. Uh, in the 2014, uh, Russian Customs Services took part in this operation. In 2011, uh, Federal Health uh, Healthcare uh, Monitoring Service became part of this operation. And since then, our cooperation has always been very dynamic. In 2014, uh, we've um, used uh, Russian uh, healthcare monitoring services who provided uh, laboratories to screen uh, to test those uh, drugs and uh, to uh, test their quality. Uh, we s we've screened uh, several dozens of samples and 13 samples proved to be illicit drugs. And uh, as a result uh, of this cooperation, uh, dozens of cases were started uh, was uh, uh, when uh, when uh, dietary supplements were sold to the customers as high-end drugs, and we have uh, transferred information about 132 websites in Russia which offer various drugs. Uh, Center uh, Interpol Bureau in Russia pays. Atten a lot of attention to uh, the federal TV channels and, and media, what is being uh, 
advertised in the media, and we try to uh, draw the public's attention uh, to to make the public aware of how harmful uh, these illicit drugs can be. And uh, in, uh, to conclude, I would like to express uh, the uh, standpoint uh, of the Russian uh, government, which supports uh, uh, Interpol activities to counter uh, falsification of various goods all over the world, including Russia. Thank you for the substantial talk. And I would like to continue and uh, give floor to another representative of Interpol, Mr. Esteban Giudici. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I would just like to start saying that um, I'm really happy of being here because, uh, for instance, yesterday I was listening attentively to the Prime Minister of the Russian Federation while he was talking about legal innovation. Now I'm hearing about uh, my colleague from the National Central Bureau, Moscow, in Interpol. And just for example, stressing uh, the situation with Internet, the problems that we are having. Some minutes ago, in another panel, I was listening to a very interesting discussion with a representative of ICANN. The ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, sort of kind of, corpor uh, of corporation that regulates somehow the Internet. And how important is that we are all together here and these days, to have a little bit of food for thought and come up with innovative legal solutions that we really need to put forward and to, and to help them to, to face this, this global challenge as it is illicit trade and counterfeit. My objective today is to, to share with you some thoughts, some ideas that we do have from Interpol uh, and with our partners and as well to put forward some questions that I don't think to have a, the ultimate answer to them, but at least I think that we are trying to, to get these, uh, these answers and to, to get somewhere to face this uh, criminal phenomenon. Just some minutes ago, for, from my colleague, from, from my boss, Stefano Vetti, we heard about the, the alarming dimensions of illicit trade as well from all the other panelists and the need to rely on the international legal framework to tackle this phenomenon. Not only from, from Interpol, and as well as I heard from Luis from WIPO, we understand that we need to find the way to put together pieces of this legal framework. This in order to maximize the interplay between the legal mechanisms that we have available for us, for the international community. And now the question that I have, uh, the idea that comes to my mind is, how do we do this? Who can do this? I think that reality is showing us that uh, the problem-solving capacities of single states are not enough to face this criminal phenomenon. Therefore, we are in presence of a global governance issue, given the, the fact that the states isolated cannot face this problem, and also given the fact that illicit trade and counterfeit are naturally and almost all the time uh, transnational crimes. They are committed in one place, the, then the effects are in another country, then the money is laundering in uh, different fiscal paradise and so on and so forth, and the criminal organizations that are behind these kind of crimes, they don't know about boundaries, they don't know about jurisdictions. So, who can address this criminal phenomenon besides the states? How can we do this? How can we effectively use the international legal framework in these times of uh, ongoing globalization and consolidated globalization together with internet? I think it's important to stress this. Well, if we take into consideration the last developments during the last 100 years or so, we can see that the century Witness an unprecedented growth in the number of international actors and the dramatic changes in the connectivity. Uh, this, uh, from the academic perspective, I think that, that it was mirrored. Uh, there was a huge boom in, between the also policy analysts in what are these new uh, 
subjects, let's say subjects of international law that had came into play. Uh, particularly, I would like to focus on international corpora corporations, which are non-state actors, which somehow are starting to, to get enough power to have the same impact as some sovereign states. Therefore, bear in mind the activities that they do and the way they carry on their industries, uh, bear in mind that they are the right holders of most of the products that are, going, uh, that are being illicitly traded or, or counterfeit, we consider that we need to work all together, all together with the civil society, with the private entities, and particularly with corporations as well as with international organizations. And we have to address this problem in a transversal way. To this end, to explain how do I think that this could happen or how we think that this could happen, I would like to put an example uh, on accessible products, specifically about tobacco products. Uh, just to give you another figure, I think that, that, that we are all well aware of the of this situation, or at least we are learning about it. Uh, the illicit trade in tobacco product is estimated in 40.5 billion a year, money that is directly channeled to criminal industries and also to terrorism. This kind of uh, illicit trade in tobacco products can be smuggled, genuine tobacco, can be counterfeit tobacco, or it can be illicit whites, that it's a new phenomenon which consists in new brands that are created legally in one country, but with the idea of smuggling that cigarette into another country without paying the tax and making the difference and making huge profit that is in detriment of, of the tax of states, public safety, security, economy, health, all these issues are involved in this. So that's why we need to be transversal and that's why we have to keep everyone on board. Recently, the international community adopted the tobacco protocol to face this problem. It's not into force yet, it's going to take some time. Uh, we have to admit that it's going to be a challenge for the member states to implement this protocol. But what I think is important, linked to what I was saying of working with corporations, with corporations, international corporations, and these type of non-state actors, is that the heart of this protocol is focused in securing the supply chain. With a licensing regime, with due diligence, track and trace, and record keeping. Now, to implement these kind of systems, we really need to have the technology. We need to have intelligence, which is going to help us to use uh, the resources and the idea that these protocols put forward. And I think that the international community was somehow understanding that we will need to develop partnerships with different actors in order to put together all this framework and in order to find, to, to find the best way to use the international framework as uh, in general that we have in the world. Well, this is just basically one example of how private entities can help the public sector, international organizations as Interpol, as WIPO, or uh, well, the law enforcement of uh, national entities. Well, I think that uh, there is not that much uh, controversies about this idea, but we have to admit that the big challenge now is how do we really do this? And here is where I have a question that is quite difficult. There are some specific examples, for instance, when Luis was mentioning uh, that they are selling you a cell phone that is counterfeit, the right holder can come and explain to the, to the police officer, the enforcement, or, almost to the, to, or also to the, to the general public, well, you can realize that it's counterfeit because of this and that, and this can help a lot. But there are many other different areas where we can cooperate. But at the same time, this is a really sensitive issue. That's why we have to be all together to discuss, to have the check and balances, and to have the right uh, policy to, to, to implement these kind of ideas, to respect the public order, the, the public policy of each state. Uh, basically, what I would like to convey, just to, 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 to give a conclusion to, to my idea, uh, and I hope that we can have a discussion on this, is that from Interpol, for, for our program, from the General Secretary, from the Office of Legal Affairs, what we are trying to do 
is to, to get together all the stakeholders from the private sector, the right holders, law enforcement, policymakers from the countries, and through seminars to capacity building activities, uh, by drafting documents, we are trying to discuss these ideas. Uh, we are trying to see how we can implement it to really foster innovation in a sustainable way, in a way that can be really be implemented among all the state members to face an issue, illicit trade and counterfeit, which is a global governance issue. Thank you very much for your attention. Спасибо большое, господин Ждичи, особенно за то, что вы подняли вопрос о необходимости подготовки универсального документа, поскольку мы действительно raising the issue of uh, building the international legal framework. We are living in, in the global world and of course uh, no individual country uh, can resolve the issue and all the countries are participating in uh, the international trades. You have mentioned uh, the illicit trade in uh, tobacco and uh, I would like uh, to give floor to the next speaker. and. Uh, it is uh, Philip uh, Morris, uh, representative uh, Konstantin Reynot. Thanks uh, a lot. The previous speaker, the previous speakers have been referring to the international cooperation and the efficiency to counter illicit trade, and the example of uh, tobacco industry is uh, quite illustrative indeed to strengthen that uh, kind of uh, cooperation since uh, the uh, problem of illicit, illicit trade is of uh, global nature indeed production supply of components uh, feedstock raw materials uh, equipment uh, and the sales of the counterfeit uh, products uh, are arranged uh, by organized uh, crime international uh, that uh, and uh, consequently the necessity of uh, different law enforcement uh, entities in uh, cooperation together with the uh, private sector and uh, business uh, cooperation manufacturers of the tobacco products uh, is uh, getting more important now than ever before. If we analyze the situation in Russia with respect to the illicit trade, it is as follows. In the early noughties, 2000, the year 2000, uh, there was no problem of illicit uh, tobacco trade. The counterfeit products were not there, and the main uh, problem was uh, illegal uh, uh, export of uh, products uh, to the countries of EU and our colleagues from uh, Interpol are only too well aware of, of it and uh, we have been uh, cooperating in this uh, area to minimize and uh, mitigate the effects of illegal flows of tobacco products from Russia to EU. However, starting from uh, 2013, there was uh, a drastic growth and uh, it, uh, of uh, excise and uh, the excise uh, were increased and uh, it uh, affected uh, the retail price uh, of the tobacco that the consumers can buy and it was uh, one of the drivers, uh, one of the catalysts uh, of uh, the growth of uh, illegal trade and the availability of uh, illicit uh, tobacco products uh, at, uh, in Russia. What we witness now we cannot say that the situation is uh, awful, that there's a greater number or a greater volume of counterfeit uh, product uh, in uh, Russia. However, we are very much uh, concerned with the prevailing trend which uh, has emerged. It is uh, the continuous growth uh, in the scope uh, of the uh, illicit uh, 
tobacco and uh, it is uh, some 15 percent uh, annually and if the trend uh, is preserved just like uh, that uh, for the next uh, five years given there are no vigorous measures undertaken by the state uh, to counter this uh, trend then i'm afraid that uh, we will have a level of uh, counterfeit uh, products uh, similar to what we have in the neighboring countries some of them are members of the eu i mean the baltic countries uh, latvia lithuania estonia but uh, taking into account uh, the uh, scope of the market of Russia, the absolute figures will be great and it would be great losses for business and uh, for the state as well, because it will be the loss of uh, budget uh, proceeds uh, from the point of view of the consumers. And uh, there, there are studies performed and uh, if uh, uh, the expenses for a pack of tobacco exceed 8% of the daily expenses, uh, the consumers uh, use uh, try to buy something cheaper and uh, primarily they find counter counterfeit products. In Russia in 2014, has uh, approached this uh, threshold of 8%. And uh, low-income uh, families, they have overcome this uh, threshold. And uh, uh, this, uh, the expenses, uh, the spending for t tobacco amounts, uh, accounts for 8.3% of the daily expenses. And uh, there is a demand uh, from the consumers in uh, counterfeit uh, products, and it is uh, evidenced and uh, proved by the specialized agency that uh, study opinion uh, or opinions of the uh, society, and uh, some 50 percent uh, of the respondents uh, questioned, questioned uh, ordinary consumers have expressed uh, concern uh, with the growth of the illicit trade at the territory of Russia. And they expressed uh, what are their expectations uh, of uh, the actions to be undertaken by the government to counter this uh, phenomenon. In Russia, there is a certain uh, specificity of uh, the counterfeit uh, goods market. In Europe, uh, the major channels of distribution of uh, the products are illicit. It could be street peddlers uh, that uh, might be selling counterfeit uh, products of uh, tobacco, or it is uh, through criminal networks in Russia, 90% of the counterfeit products are sold, are being sold through legal outlets, through legal chains. And the counterfeit products are normally mixed with the original products and the consumers wishing to buy original products they uh, they are he he or she is being cheated and counterfeit products are being peddled what shall we do in uh, my opinion uh, to prevent uh, the further growth uh, of uh, the illicit trade in uh, russia as uh, i have said the uh, problem hasn't got uh, any one separate solution that ca could eradicate uh, Ill uh, illegal products, illicit products, counterfeit products. A comprehensive approach is needed, and in Russia a number of steps were undertaken to counter the problems. Namely, in early 2015, there was a federal law, number 530, uh, to uh, counter the sales of counterfeit and uh, contraband, uh, ca contraband uh, products of uh, alcohol, beverage and tobacco. And uh, this particular law has uh, 
covered uh, the gaps uh, in uh, a legislature that uh, did not uh, allow us uh, to start uh, efficient and uh, fight against this uh, phenomenon. Namely, there was uh, a new article of the Criminal Code. It is Article 200, uh, which is uh, related uh, to the contraband of uh, tobacco and uh, alcohol. So illicit trade in tobacco and uh, alcohol is criminalized again, and it provides uh, quite efficient uh, leverage uh, for the law enforcement agencies and the uh, customs uh, officials uh, to eradicate uh, the input uh, of uh, smuggled uh, products uh, into Russia. Second thing, there's a radical reduction of uh, the level of damage uh, after which uh, uh, the damage is uh, criminalized. Previously, one has uh, to uh, misappropriate or d d confiscate uh, uh, half, a m half a million, 1.5 million rubles, 1.5 million, that was the threshold before, now it is 200,000, and of course is going to effect, uh, uh, affect uh, the law enforcement uh, practices and uh, the number of the criminal uh, cases uh, against uh, the offenders uh, would be increased. The punitive sanctions uh, uh, related to the other articles of the criminal codes uh, have uh, been applied, uh, like uh, related to excise uh, fees and uh, the penalties uh, covered by the administrative code uh, have been strengthened uh, against uh, the distributors of the counterfeit uh, products. There was reference made to the international law and uh, Esteban Guidici said uh, that a universal regulatory framework is needed to be enforced uh, by all the nations that might result in positive uh, progress uh, to counteract uh, illicit trade. As far as uh, tobacco products are concerned, uh, we do have uh, such uh, a framework. Uh, it is uh, the Tobacco Protocol of uh, the Framework uh, Convention of uh, the World Health Organization. The reference was made to it as well. And uh, the uh, protocol incorporates uh, the key requirements, in our opinion, uh, to introduce uh, amendments uh, into the national legal framework uh, and uh, if those requirements are implemented uh, then the comprehensive approach will be adopted and uh, to close and to eliminate uh, all the weaknesses gaps uh, in the legislator that uh, make it possible for the offenders uh, to pursue uh, their illegal activity. The protocol provides for, first, licensing systems uh, for production, import and export uh, of uh, tobacco products uh, and uh, manufacturing equipment. Why is it important? For example, in Russia, if you want to bring in uh, ready uh, products, so you can do that uh, through uh, customs only. If you want to uh, bring in uh, tobacco uh, raw materials for tobacco production or equipment production lines, you can do it uh, through any uh, customs office or customs uh, point. Nobody will ask you. Uh, for any licenses or any documents. Nobody would ask you why you're doing this. Um, and nobody's interested uh, in where it's going, where this raw material will go to, where this equipment goes to, uh, where these filters uh, go to. Secondly, we need to 
uh, create universal uh, instruments to monitor, to control uh, tobacco uh, products. Uh, it is very important to when we, when we have a final product, a pack of cigarettes, with a system of labeling, we could use this system of labeling to uh, see the logistics behind this pack. How well it, we could see its life cycle, uh, its way, the way it made from the producer, from the manufacturer to the uh, point of destination. It's important for our colleagues abroad when they're doing, when they're investigating chains, supply chains of counterfeit products. For internal bodies in uh, this system uh, uh, provides an, an, uh, a chance to see whether the product is original. This label could uh, enable you uh, to see uh, in an online regime to see whether the product is original and uh, make a decision uh, what to do next in the sense of law enforcement. Uh, another demand uh, is uh, how do we eliminate, how do we uh, eliminate the confiscated material and, and products. Uh, in our law, we have provisions for that because we need to destroy uh, counterfeit products uh, following the decision by the court. As for equipment, uh, there is still a lot to be discussed. And very often, this confiscated equipment, which, according to the court's decision, is delivered to uh, a special body uh, responsible for further selling of the confiscated goods. It is later bought by criminals and you see it uh, popping up in the market and the criminals keep producing counterfeit goods using this equipment. And even, uh, finally, we need to create a system uh, to control counter agents for all uh, participants of supply chain, the so-called due diligence proce procedure. And uh, in this regard, uh, self-organization is very important and uh, business responsibility and accountability uh, becomes very important when businesses themselves introduce uh, those procedures and systems and uh, see if they're implemented properly. Russia uh, and uh, its Prime Minister, Mr. Medvedev, in, in October 2013, uh, declared a decision uh, to uh, become part of the protocol. And it, this decision was supported in November last year by the Minister, Minister of Health Care of the Russian Federation, Ms. Kvartsova. However, and, and uh, it was uh, pronounced that a project, a draft uh, of legislation has been prepared to uh, uh, join the protocol. However, today we're still uh, at the same stage uh, compared to last year's November. As for the trends, uh, today's contemporary trends uh, uh, in the illicit goods market, in the illicit tobacco market in Russia, we, s we would uh, probably argue for a faster procedure uh, for Russia uh, joining this protocol and implementing uh, uh, this protocol uh, into the uh, national legislation. Uh, although we do see some very positive steps in implementation of the protocol requirements, uh, uh, Law 530 uh, is, serves as an implementation of the key requirements of the protocol on uh, enhancing liability uh, for uh, those involved in uh, illicit tobacco trade. And uh, to conclude, I would like to point out that the problem, uh, the uh, fighting illicit trade, 
uh, needs to be supported by the state. Uh, legislators have provided us with instruments, and the main focus is now for at least uh, uh, close uh, for the nearest time is to uh, make uh, these implementations efficient, uh, these no measures efficient, and we would probably focus our efforts on uh, law enforcement. Uh, and uh, international cooperation, and uh, I hope that our colleagues from Interpol and uh, Interpol and Russia's bureau will assist us. We'd also need within the system of the Ministry of Internal Affair Affairs to recreate a specialized body that would uh, that did exist. Uh, the bodies which would uh, uh, focus on excised products and focus on countering and preventing a crime uh, in tobacco uh, supply, in the tobacco industry, uh, creating universal instruments to monitor and label uh, tobacco products. Uh, I mean, uh, labeling packs, uh, cigarette packs. And uh, what would we need from our legislators? Uh, there's a hot topic that needs to be covered by legislation is uh, destruction of equipment. This is something we need to uh, be provided for to prevent further production, further manufacturing of counterfeit uh, goods. And this is probably uh, an outlook, uh, summary of, uh, uh, of the trends that we find important and uh, um, uh, the trends where we feel government could be of greater help and we representing tobacco industry uh, who are in interested in uh, working in a legal market. Uh, we, on our behalf, are ready to assist you in any possible way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Konstantin, uh, uh, and especially thank you for telling us uh, uh, about the algorithm of how we can counter illicit uh, trade. Uh, we, we have special bodies in the Ministry of Internal Affairs. It's a department on uh, economic crimes, and these bodies, these departments, employ uh, experts who uh, fight uh, counterfeit goods, uh, alcohol produce, and uh, illicit alcohol uh, uh, produce. Uh, there's no amendment, need, no need for amendments. We are working on it. We already have these bodies. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Alexei Andronov, uh, who is uh, the uh, head uh, of the legal department of Megapolis Company. I would like to thank Alexander Gennadievich for bringing me, me here. And it's, it's a great honor. And it's, uh, I've, I have a general to my right for the first time in my life sitting next to me. Oh, we are now, uh, we're, we're living, I mean, we're standing uh, our feet on the ground. We sell uh, products manufactured by the companies, and among our shareholders, we have GTI and Philip Morris. And uh, uh, and we are, uh, uh, we have certain liabilities. We have certain obligations. Illicit trade uh, is damages to the state because a huge share. I mean, if you take a cigarette pack, uh, a lot of its price ca is excise. So if it is produced illegally, the state has not received anything. Uh, it is damages to the manufacturer and uh, for us because we sell it.
uh, as I was taught in the university, uh, it is to sell the product that is important, not to manufacture it. If nobody uh, needs it, why, why do you do this? I mean, uh, changes in legislation and uh, enhancing liability for illicit trade, uh, in, uh, tobacco trade, uh, did uh, attract uh, attention of the law enforcement orders, uh, or, uh, bodies. Police finds uh, these cases more interesting. Uh, they uh, they bring these cases, they investigate them, they bring them to courts. I wouldn't say there are many cases of this kind, uh, but still uh, it is developing rather fast. If we find uh, in retail or with wholesale uh, suppliers, if we find counterfeit uh, uh, products, we coordinate our actions with the supplier, we uh, test the products, and we interact with the law enforcement bodies, because we need to investigate a case if, if it comes up. And uh, the responsibility and, account and, and the, uh, the criminals should be liable. We know, we being uh, lawyers, we understand that it is inevitability of this punishment that is in important. If uh, those illicit producers would know uh, that eventually they will be punished, they will probably think twice. As for our company, uh, we pay great attention to to our clients, to our customers, uh, those we work with. And uh, oh, we uh, implement certain policies which try to counter illicit trade. And I can quote, we have a policy uh, on uh, countering uh, illicit trade. And I can even, uh, it's, it's a splendid policy. We understand, uh, we do a lot to, to make market legal to uh, sell legal products and to minimize illicit trade. We uh, operate in, uh, internationally. We are uh, present in CIS countries in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan. And we understand that uh, the level, uh, uh, we understand how, it, uh, how it's happening. Uh, everywhere. It's, uh, we're talking about fast-moving goods, uh, the goods that are in demand, and uh, we must, together with the law enforcement bodies and our customers, that we all interact. I can tell you that this chain that Konstantin was talking about, we link. We, we need to understand the links. We need to see how the goods are moving from the supplier to the end user. And uh, then we'd be able, with uh, uh, contemporary, well, with, with sophisticated technology, using sophisticated technology, we'd be able to follow, to see uh, and do everything we can to deliver right, proper cigarettes to the end user. I think we are moving faster than Russian legislation. Uh, we have adopted within the company, and in this regard, I am very grateful to our shareholders, to our international shareholders, who introduce their best practices and share their best practices with us. Uh, so today uh, we've adopted, every morning we keep thinking, what can we do to make it more efficient? It sometimes seems to us we've done it all. We have 160,000 clients, although some of my, my mobile uh, uh, operators tell us that they have like, you know, millions of clients. They are customers, they, buy, they would buy a SIM card and that's it. We have very different customers. Uh, we are talking about retail, we are talking about uh, 
uh, chains, uh, networks. We're talking about private customers, and we check each client. We uh, find it important to have a client that would adhere to uh, uh, to all our policies, that would comply with our policies. We have uh, obligations, we have liabilities uh, against our suppliers. We cannot sell illicit goods to a legal seller. If we are uncertain about our client, about our customer, we do our best to stop uh, this, uh, uh, this interaction. We get uh, complaints, uh, and people file complaints to the anti-monopoly service, and uh, these complaints are being reviewed thoroughly. But judging from our experience, every time we break relations with, uh, we stop relations with uh, uh, suspicious uh, traders, uh, and um, anti-monopoly service always supports us. As for legislation, and I'm, I'm trying to close, uh, the, uh, the problem is so important that our president has signed a decree on uh, countermeasures uh, against illicit uh, trade. And uh, it provides for a state committee. This act, this decree, states, uh, provides for a state committee, which includes all ministers, all federal ministers, including head of the uh, Russian Fishing Service. And we expect this committee to uh, give us a fundamental solution uh, of these problems, because I think that it is only through mutual efforts uh, of business and state bodies we can overcome this uh, and solve this problem. I'm happy to see Interpol representatives here and people from the internal ministry because it means we understand we can only solve this problem together. I guess this is it. Uh, thank you, Alexei Mikhailovich. I kept thinking, uh, day before yesterday, yesterday we came to Moscow, and the train that was, uh, was, was bringing us to Moscow, it was called Megapolis. Was it your company's train? Maybe we bought it, I don't know. I'll make sure. Uh, legally, no, legally, no, legally, legally. Uh, to give you an example, since we are talking uh, about it, two, two events uh, in, a, uh, in April uh, cases. Uh, in April 2015, they found a storage with uh, illicit tobacco, uh, foreign tobacco with no excise. Uh, and uh, it was found out that they were meant to be sold uh, in duty-free shops. And uh, there were th uh, th uh, tens of thousands of packs. Uh, and it, uh, that, uh, that cost over 9 million rubles. There were a lot of bags and suitcases. Uh, uh, that the criminals planned to use to transfer this tobacco abroad. And uh, uh, a man, a 40-year-old man from Yaroslavl, was responsible for this whole case. I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, we're talking about global stuff here, but uh, there are some actual cases and some results uh, we are happy to uh, quote. Uh, in 2014, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs have closed down over 40 illicit uh, alcohol production facilities and uh, dozens of illegal groups and uh, seven, uh, over 700 decaliters of ethyl, uh, of ethanol, of ethyl uh, alcohol. Uh, was has had been discovered and two million over two million decaliters of alcohol 
produce has been extracted. Uh, uh, this is just to mention a few cases. We're drawing to a close, and I would uh, like to ask my maybe ask my colleagues any comments. Shall we? Shall we? Uh, the mic. They will bring the mic. And I have a question to Mr. St Stefana. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, and um, I found the comment that you made uh, whether there is a real damage to the uh, production companies from the counterfeiting goods is very relevant. Uh, so I have two questions. One, um, do you think there is a damage uh, of the, for instance, uh, pharma companies or fashion companies or tobacco companies? Uh, do they suffer real damages? Uh, from the fact that goods that are illegally produced under their brands are sold, for instance, on the territory of the European Union. That's the question number one. And the question number two, uh, is there a request from these companies uh, for, uh, to Interpol to investigate these matters and to uh, stop this illegal trade? For instance, is there a request from fashion industry? Is there a request from pharma industry? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, I do think, and, that, and I think many people will tell you that um, um, IP violations directly damage the industry that legitimately produce certain goods. Uh, to a more or less extent, but it involves all the industries. And there are real issues of declining market shares uh, that are affecting those uh, those interests, and it's not by and it's not by chance that many multinationals uh, from the luxury industry, but also pharmaceuticals and all sorts of goods, they have specialized anti-counterfeiting units within their own uh, structure that are dedicated 24 hours per day in in finding out the internet websites that sell counterfeit stuff and in. Uh, um, uh, pursuing legally um, alleged offenders all around the world. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a big thing, right? Uh, moving to your second question, do these companies come to Interpol? Uh, the answer is not directly, certainly. Interpol is not uh, in itself a law enforcement agency. I Interpol, at least uh, um, the Interpol Secretariat, uh, is an international organization that is supposed to coordinate the action of national police worldwide. So uh, in principle, what would happen is if, if a company has an issue, has a problem, has a complaint, he would have to go to the local law enforcement authorities, right? And possibly also the role of the National Central Bureau of Interpol, which is based in all of the member states, will be relevant here, right? Um, uh, what Interpol then does is uh, possibly connecting the various dots worldwide to, uh, to ensure there is cooperation between police officers. Um, I believe that in these specific issues, maybe the representatives of the NCB Russian can, can answer more precisely your question, right? Спасибо. Uh, thank you. Then maybe we should uh, wrap it up because we're out of time. And I would like to express my gratitude to all the speakers for sharing uh, their problems. And uh, we've only touched upon very few uh, issues. Uh, we haven't covered uh, all the types of products that we deal with. And uh, uh, maybe uh, we need to add uh, new products and uh, provide monitoring systems. Uh, all people present here are working in this field, and our today's dialogue will act as an additional starting point for new uh, 
measures to counter illicit uh, trade in and illicit uh, turnover, uh, illicit supply, uh, uh, creating a universal document uh, has also been an issue uh, at the 13th Congress on uh, countering crime uh, in April in Doha, the Doha Congress in April, and uh, at the 24th session of the UN Commission uh, in, uh, in May, on uh, the 18th, 21st of May in Vienna. Uh, I just want to emphasize that these uh, issues are constantly being discussed and uh, by international organizations uh, whose representatives uh, are here today and uh, on the national level, uh, national legislation is constantly uh, introducing regulatory changes, uh, regula uh, 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 new implements new measures to uh, deal with it on the uh, national level. Thank you very much.